Hello everyone, I'm Mathias Lécuyer. I'm currently a postdoc at Microsoft Research and I'll start as an assistant professor at UBC next year. And today I'll talk about data protection for machine learning platforms. And I'll start with the observation that the increasing deployment of machine learning introduces a double standard for data protection. So what do I mean by that? Let's illustrate this double standard by taking a messaging application as an example. In a modern messaging application, you probably have a database that will store the users, their messages, and a lot of metadata, like their clicks, their likes. And this database is continuously growing as users interact with the application. The core logic of the application will be implemented with traditional code that interacts with the data to record and display users' messages. And this code will be exposed through an API, possibly to third parties, and maybe part of it will run on users' devices for speed. Still, you do not expect everyone to have access to your messages. Why? Every call to the data will be mediated by some access control logic, which ensures that data is protected. This data protection and access control is a key concern in systems design. Now, if you look at the ML part of an application, we'll use a machine learning platform like Google's TensorFlow Extended maybe to train models for different features of the application, such as an autocomplete model, some ad targeting model, maybe a recommendation model, and we will serve predictions both through APIs and directly on users' devices. A key difference with traditional code, though, is that the models and their predictions are not based on the data ju from just one user, but on everyone's messages, likes, and clicks. And you know, that would be okay if machine learning only captured general trends from the data. But in practice, machine learning also captures specific information about individual entries in the data set. Language models can reveal text snippets from their training data, including secrets like a social security number or a credit card number. Access to a model's predictions is sufficient to infer with high accuracy whether a specific data point was in the training set. Recommendation models may leak information about specific behavior from a user to their friends. So a question I try to answer in my work is, how can we build into machine learning platforms the same level of control over data that we have in traditional code? Fortunately, uh, we at least know a good starting point. We can use differential privacy on the machine learning algorithms to bound the leakage of training set data through those models. At a high level, uh, the idea behind differential privacy is that you have a database with sensitive data, such as a data set of drug purchases, and you want to allow an analyst to query it to discover epidemics, for instance but without exposing the details of individual participants. And differential privacy was the first and remains the only rigorous definition of privacy for this kind of use case. And the way uh, differential privacy defines privacy is essentially as a stability constraint on computations that run on that database. It requires that no single observation in the input data set has a significant influence over the output of the computation. So from a privacy perspective, because no observation can significantly change the output, someone looking at that output cannot learn too much information about any specific observation in the database. And this stability constraint is formalized with the following formula. Essentially, it says that to achieve differential privacy, 
randomness has to be added into the computation to enforce the following invariant. For any pair of input databases that differ in at most one entry, the probability distribution over all possible outputs of the computation doesn't change much when the computation is invoked on one database or the other. And there are two parameters, epsilon and delta, the main one being epsilon, as it controls how much uh, the distribution can change. And the interpretation is that it bounds the privacy loss that can occur through the computation. The differential privacy literature is pretty mature at this point, including in machine learning, where differential privacy has been used to prevent data leakage attacks by adding noise during model training. And there exist such uh, differentially private training algorithms for virtually any type of model you might want to train. And there's a few key properties of differential privacy that I want to highlight because they're uh, important for our goal. First, uh, making a machine learning model differentially private prevents the attacks I listed earlier, even when an attacker has arbitrary side information. So it's a very strong defense. Second, the differential privacy guarantee is resilient to post-processing, which means that any differentially private output like a machine learning model, uh, which is the output of differentially tr private training, is protected. So we can release it publicly, uh, we can make predictions with it and release them, and the privacy loss uh, will never be higher than the differential privacy parameter we used. And finally, the privacy loss from multiple differential privacy results adds up according to a composition theorem which uh, basic form says that the privacy loss uh, sums, sums up. So if we had only one model, we know what to do. We can make it differentially private and prevent data leakage from this model. However, uh, this is insufficient in practice. We are computing many different models, as we've seen, but we're also computing them over and over again, both on new data and reusing old data. So across releases of many versions of many models, the privacy loss adds up such that globally, the privacy guarantee will become meaningless. So what we really want to do is to enforce a global differential privacy guarantee across all models ever released by the platform. So how can we do that? Well, to do that in a practical way, we need to mitigate two challenges with differential privacy, which are significant roadblocks to differentially private machine learning platforms running out of privacy budget and the privacy utility trade-off. So I'll describe uh, them in turn and, see, and show um, one way we can address them. The first challenge is that most differential privacy work has focused on a fixed database model in which for each model trained, we incur some privacy loss that accumulates. And if we use this fixed database interaction model, here's what happens. We train a first machine learning model and incur some privacy loss, then a second one and its loss adds up. And when we train a third model, we reach the maximum privacy loss we can tolerate, and that's it, we are done. No new model can ever be trained, even after new data is collected, and we just run out of privacy budget. So the key to adapt differential privacy um, to machine learning platforms is to realize that we need to develop a new interaction model for differential privacy, which is better suited to machine learning workloads which operate on this growing database. And we call this new interaction model um, that we develop block composition. And there's four main uh, characteristics I want to describe. 
first, we split that database into blocks of data with a fixed uh, time length. Second, we run models on combined blocks to form larger data sets. And that's very important because different machine learning models have different data requirements. So here, model one runs on the first two blocks while model two uses the first four because maybe it's a larger model that needs more data. And third, we account for privacy loss only on the blocks each model used. So here, model one consumed some privacy loss for the first two blocks, while model two consumes uh, some budget of the first four. And finally, models can influence fut future differential privacy parameters as well as future data blocks. So maybe because of the output of model one and model two, we'll design to train model three with different parameters, maybe on different data blocks or with a different privacy budget. Models can also influence the data we collect. So imagine a recommendation model. If we change it, it will change its recommendations. So the users will behave differently and the data we even collect will be different. So all this is allowed into the, um, our new interaction model. And despite that, we still account for the privacy loss of the new model, model three here, only uh, on the blocks it uses. And what we show in the paper is that in this model, the global privacy loss on the whole growing database and over every model ever released by the system is smaller than the highest privacy loss of any block in the growing database. So why is this important? Well, as long as we don't use blocks with exhausted budget, we preserve a global differential privacy guarantee over the whole system. And now, when a new block comes out, it's never been used before, so it has zero privacy loss, and we can keep operating as long as new data arrives fast enough. Okay, so let's now look at the second challenge, uh, the privacy utility trade-off, which I'll uh, illustrate with some plots. So if we look at the performance of different models under differential privacy, so here on the um, x-axis, I show a growing data sizes, and on the y-axis, uh, lower uh, shows a better utility from a model, so it's just a better model. And going up in colors, uh, we see um, more and more private models, so we use higher uh, lower and lower differential privacy parameters for it. And what we see is that at a fixed um, amount of data we give to the model, there's this privacy utility trade-off where the more private we want the model to be, the less uh, utility we'll get out of that model. And now we are with uh, this block composition, we are training models on subsets of the data with differential privacy. So when we release a model, will it be any good? Well, if you recall the privacy accuracy trade-off for a given data size, increasing privacy decreases utility. So if we don't do anything, the answer is clearly no, especially if they use only a bit of the privacy budget. However, we can also see that we can give a model more and more data to compensate for the effect of differential privacy. Like they will reach a good performance, they just need more data. And this is exactly what we do um, to practically address this privacy utility trade-off uh, by using iterative training. So there are three main steps to this technique. First, uh, remember that in our interaction model, we can adaptively choose data blocks and differential privacy parameters. So what we're going to do is train a model, and if it's not good enough, we just 
schedule it for training again uh, using more data or more uh, privacy budget. Now we still need a way to make sure that the model is good enough to be released at some point. So what we'll do is we'll piggyback on the machine learning infrastructure that typically includes an evaluation phase where the model is compared to a previous model or to some threshold uh, given by, uh, by the developer. So this evaluation uses a separate test set and runs a statistical test to ensure that the model meets desired performance criteria, such as accuracy higher than some threshold with high probability. However, this test also needs to be differentially private to ensure that data, the test data is protected. And if we do that naively, we basically break the guarantee of the statistical test because it doesn't account for the differential privacy randomness. Intuitively, um, we might get unlucky and get a differential privacy noise draw that will make the, the accuracy look really good when in fact it's not, and we may release a really bad model because of it. Fortunately, we know the, the noise distribution for differential privacy because it's public information, so we can use it. And we can fix the test by accounting for the probability that the test succeeded only because of bad chance with the noise draws from differential privacy. And so this is the, the changed formula to make sure that the statistical st test is still valid. Okay, so let's see how this works empirically. I'm just going to show you the main result, the main empirical result. So this graph shows a machine learning workload running on a, on a data set of taxi rides in New York City. And the workload uh, consists of uh, multiple models from large deep neural networks uh, all the way down to uh, basic summary statistics of the data. And on the x-axis, um, I show an increasing rate at which the new models are registered with the machine learning platform to be trained. And here, uh, data blocks have roughly 16,000 data points, which is about one hour of data on this data set. So 0 0.4 roughly corresponds to 10 models per day being registered for training. Now on the y-axis, um, I show how long it takes to release models on average in steady state. And it's still measured in blocks, so in, in hours, basically. And what we see is that when only a few models are registered per day, um, all method, uh, basically traditional differential privacy composition, and this new block composition and iterative training can handle the workload and release models in less than a day on average. But as soon as the rate increases, the new block composition is much more efficient with, with its use of privacy budget and it can um, support up to 15 new models trained a day and still re release them within 24 hours, whereas um, traditional differential privacy composition is limited to uh, roughly five models per day. Cool, so to summarize, um, differential privacy literature has mostly focused on individual machine learning algorithms running on sta static databases. Machine learning workloads, on the other hand, operate on growing databases, where models incorporate new data and adaptively reuse old data. So we adapt differential privacy theory and practice to those machine learning workloads on growing databases for data protection. And this was a paper published with collaborators at Columbia at uh, SOSP last year. And this framework to integrate differential privacy into machine learning platforms uh, opens really exciting new research directions. So I'll give two uh, very brief examples of ongoing efforts. So first, when we integrate this technique in a broader resource, man resource management system like Kubernetes and Kubeflow, for instance, we introduce a new resource, which is the privacy budget. So a natural question is, how should the platform 
manage and allocate this resource alongside computational ones. And another natural question is that access control usually operates at the level of data for an entire user. But here, in our model, we're protecting only individual observations. So can we bridge the gap by using user-level differential privacy to have a more uh, natural uh, level of protection? So these are questions that we are uh, trying to answer with uh, the same group at Columbia. And a second exciting direction is that of systems mechanism we can introduce. So in the integration I described, all computations are limited by the finite uh, differential privacy budget. And what do we do in systems when we have expensive operations that limit utility? Well, we cache them as much as possible so we can reuse work. So with a great group at uh, UBC, we are looking at what it means to add a cache for differential privacy results to such a design to try and minimize privacy budget spending and get more uh, value out of it. So on those uh, two ongoing work, uh, I'll thank you for listening. Thanks.